John Johnson, United States Army, Korea, the Forgotten War. I had the great pleasure and opportunity of interviewing John in St. Charles, Missouri. It was November 3rd, 2007, a long time ago, folks. He enlisted in the Army. He was 17 years old, August 17th, 1949. A year later, he was in Korea. He wanted to be a paratrooper. He wanted to be an airborne soldier. And so he went to jump school. Out of jump school, he was assigned to the 511th Parachute Infantry Regiment. And from there, he went to Korea. He made the Incheon landing, and he tells a tremendous story, folks, one of my best stories about the Korean War. And I want to thank Brandon Glidden again. Brandon, love you, brother. Thank you for your support of my work and the support of the veterans that you are helping tell their stories. And it's just great to have you with me, to partner with me, Brandon. I, I don't take it for granted, and I thank you for it, sir. If you'd like to become a sponsor of one of these stories, folks, those of you watching and being blessed by these stories, let's pay it for it. Let's pay it forward, folks. I would encourage you to sponsor a story. There's information in the video description below this video. Or if you'd just like to donate to my work, there's information in the comment section of this video. And you can go to LarryCapetto.com and find all that information. So let's keep this thing going, folks. Freedom is not free. Freedom is earned. There's a price to pay for our freedoms. Thank God for these veterans. Happy to share John Johnson's story with you right now. Please subscribe to this channel and share these videos. Let's keep this thing going. Okay, God bless you. So okay. I'm looking forward to, um, you know, to hearing some, mm -hmm. some good things here. So, this, let's go back. What did you go into the military? You getting drafted or do you enlisted? Right. I I quit school and enlisted uh, into the airborne. Uh, that was pre-assigned. You know, uh, okay. that was a result of seeing a big poster in front of the Civil Courts Building downtown St. Louis be a paratrooper and it impressed me and I was 17 and I said yeah that's that's what I want to do so I went in and signed up old. yes wow. so I went in and signed up yeah. and what year was that that was uh, August 17th 1949 okay so World War II is over and Korea really hadn't started yet no it hadn't and I, that was one of the unique things I thought when I went into service well you know I'm going in it's peacetime uh, World War II is over, there won't be another war, and lo and behold, June of 1950, uh, less, well, is that less or just slightly over a year, just less than a year after I enlisted, uh, sure enough, Korea broke out. Five years it, it's after the end of World War II. And did it catch, you think it caught the country by surprise or what, what, did we see it coming or what do you think? I think it caught the country by surprise. I don't think they were anticipating anything like that. And where were you initially and what type of reports did you hear about Korea? Did you hear about the Incheon landing or what? Or were you uh, part of that? Yeah, I was part of the Incheon landing. Uh, I was immediately following jump school. I was assigned to the 511th Parachute Infantry Regiment at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And uh, when word that North Korea invaded South Korea, they, they uh, put the 511th Regiment with the 187, which was originally a glider regiment, and they formed what they called the 187th Airborne Regimental Combat Team. And uh, from Fort Campbell, uh, we loaded on the troop trains right there at Fort Campbell all the way out to California to be shipped over. So you trained to California and then what, on a boat or what? Yeah, we took a troop ship and we landed in uh, Osaka, I believe it was Osaka, Japan, and we went to a large air base and uh, from that air base we got all re-equipped with all brand new weaponry that was still in Cosmoline and they had big 55 gallon drums of boiling water and they showed us how if you had, every man in the airborne carries a 45 side weapon in addition to his regular weapon. 
and they had like stiff wire and they said wire it around the trigger guard, drop it down in the tank of boiling water and uh, that took the cosmoline off and then of course we cleaned them, dried them and put oil on them and uh, from there uh, we loaded up on aircraft and we were on our way to secure Impo, Kempo airfield in South Korea and they said the North Koreans were moving toward capturing Kempo Field. As we were in the air and we were all suited up, had our parachutes on and anticipating a, a combat jump and out over the ocean they told us get out of your parachute harness the planes are going to land because the Marines have already started securing Kempo Field. We don't want you dropped in there and they mistake you for some kind of enemy paratroopers and or vice versa, us mistake them for enemy. So in essence, they said the plane will touch the ground, come to a rolling stop. You're to jump out the door onto the ground as quickly as you can possibly get out of the airplane because he's immediately going to turn around and take off to prevent being blown up. So there we were right in the middle of this, the fire uh, from day one fighting with the Marines and sure enough we secured Kempo Field and uh, then we moved on up and uh, I recall we were moving north uh, after securing Kempo Field and uh, uh, we got ambushed and uh, I got hit by I think it was one of their large Chinese martyrs landed relatively close to me. I, it, seemed like I went 10 feet in the air. I mean, the impact was unbelievable. And the shrapnel went into my right knee, slightly behind my right knee. But uh, that's when they took me by Jeep. They put me on the front of the Jeep with a M1 rifle as a shotgun, so to speak, because he had two litters on the back of the Jeep. And uh, we were headed for a MASH unit. And after I got to the MASH unit, they let me stay around there about two days, I guess evaluating what was going to be best. They decided they couldn't do anything. They were afraid to go in after the shrapnel, so they sent me out to Inchon Harbor. I believe it was Inchon Harbor. Uh, and I was loaded aboard the USS Consolation. Uh, and uh, I was aboard that for several days. Kind of an interesting experience. I actually got to see the battleship Missouri off to the side of the, when I was able to go topside on the Constellation, I, somebody pointed out to me, they said, there's the battleship Missouri over there, watch, they're firing for ground support for the guys on the ground somewhere. Sure enough, I got to see those big 16 inch guns firing, just constant boom, boom, boom. And I, of course, later learned those are 16 inch projectiles. Now, I don't know at what point that we fought with the Marines in securing Inchon, but we did, and it must have been before I got wounded, and I have my correlation mixed up, possibly, because we were awarded the Navy Presidential Unit Citation, and that is a rare, rare occurrence for an Army unit to receive the Navy Presidential, in addition to us receiving the America or the Army Presidential Unit Citation, and of course later on we received the Korean Presidential Unit Citation. Well, one, while aboard the Constellation, uh, so seemingly word came down that anybody who was jump qualified was to immediately return to the unit. So, so to speak, I was walking wounded. They took me off the boat, took me to shore. Of course young stupid me, I thought there was going to be a jeep there that said 187 on it waiting to pick me up and take me back to my unit. Not true. Uh, so I actually fought my way back up to my unit with the Marines. Fifth Marines is all I can remember. I don't remember, I, I have later learned that that's part of the first division of the Marine Corps. Yeah, the fifth Marines first, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, okay. What month was this, do you remember? Oh man, like? no I don't. I, I really don't. I wish I had all the, I had in that booklet 
the book that I have like that, it does have all those dates okay. and it That's has okay. it all in correlation. So anyway, I got back to my outfit and at that time we were uh, taking off from Kempo Field and we were going to fly out over the ocean and up into North Korea. Our objective was to capture the North Korean capital of Pyongyang and we would be parachuting in at a place called Sunchan Sukchan, which was about 20 miles north of the North Korean capital. Well, once we, uh, interesting, I got to talking with the C-47 pilot who was the, the plane I was going to be loading up in. And I said, I thought these were obsolete at the end of World War II. He said, well, they are. He said, it might make it up there, though. <laughs> I said, well, that's a lot of confidence. He says, yeah, you never know. He said, they're, they're good planes. So anyway, we got up in North Korea. Part of, part of the 187th was to jump a little bit further. I don't know if it would have been to the north or south of where we were. And they were to capture a uh, enemy train loaded with prisoners of war. And our objective was to capture the capital of Pyongyang, which we did. Uh, on the way moving that 20 miles, we overran uh, several North Korean training facilities, uh, taking a lot of POWs, killing a lot. Of course, there was a lot of fighting involved. And uh, then we went street fighting uh, like they're doing now uh, through Pyongyang and eventually did capture that. We set up headquarters in an old building that had a large Stalin uh, mural painted on the wall and some said that that was pure gold that that was painted on there, that that used to be the Russian embassy for North Korea. I don't know, but anyway, uh, then we moved out of Pyongyang and started moving back toward the 38th parallel and uh, uh, there were, let me see, moving back and, and our objective then was to uh, capture and are of course engage and kill the enemy that were retreating because there was a major offensive MacArthur had launched. Uh, and the North Korean army was being pushed back toward us and we were behind them and they didn't know that of course. So once that situation got resolved, uh, we captured a lot and they sent a lot of them back. Then uh, we continued moving north at that point I think. Uh, yeah, we did. We continued moving north. I remember the uh, the winter of 1950 was so brutally cold, so cold. They served us what, when they put it on our mess kit, was a hot, uh, I think it was Thanksgiving or maybe Christmas dinner, one or the other. And by the time we could get located where we were going to sit down and eat it, it was already starting to freeze. And uh, it, it just, uh, it was unbelievably cold. We did not have any type of good cold weather gear. What we basically had was all handed down equipment from World War II. We had water-cooled 30 caliber machine guns. They're no good in freezing weather. So you just unplug the water connection and use it as best you can. Of course, we did have the air-cooled light machine guns also because uh, M Company, which I was in, is a uh, heavy weapons company. And basically what we do is provide cover fire for the infantry companies as they attack. Of course, that doesn't mean we're not face to face in the combat. We were uh, right up with them. And uh, there were times we had to guard a mountain pass somewhere. I, I, I believe it was called the Tang Yang Mountains. And at that time, it was the only supply route to get supplies to the other troops that were further north than we were. And it was, we were literally looking down at the clouds. We were up above the clouds. We were so high. That naturally made it much, much colder. And uh, we had uh, 
frozen and thawed ground, just a no dirt road and six by coming by the big uh, trucks, you know, the two ton trucks or whatever they are. And uh, they would get stuck in that mud, rut and ice. And, and uh, one of our guys, there were a bunch of us were pushing. We all, you know, while the driver had it in gear and was trying to get the thing going, we would grab a hold anywhere we could of the truck. And one of our guys slipped and fell under the rear wheels, crushed his leg instantly. And of course, the medic popped him with the morphine and he was okay till they got him down out of the mountain somehow, I guess, took him back down by ambulance. And uh, then we, uh, after, after that, we kept moving north ourselves. And we were fairly close to the Yalu River and the Chinese entered the conflict. That was a whole new ball game. There were millions and millions. They were like ants. We had them literally, when we were back to the mountain pass, they would come up those ravines and we had Chinese troops coming up that mountain pass who had up the, the ravines, watersheds, who had their feet frozen. They were their feet were wrapped in rags and coal black. Just, it, it was miserable. I mean, it was, it was horrible. And some of the POWs, when questioned, said that they fought for that little ball of rice that they had on their belt, tied to their belt. It was just like the size of a baseball. They said that's why they joined the Army, was for that ball of rice. So anyway, uh, that, that's an idea of how cold that winter was up there. Well, naturally, as you know, they pushed, the Chinese pushed us all the way back down. Uh, I think it was back to Pusan, if I'm not mistaken. I remember going through Seoul, South Korea so many times that I got to where I knew it by heart, uh, going across that Han River and those pontoon bridges. And of course, the engineers, after you cross the, the river, they cut the bridges loose and let them float downstream. Is They're, this the chosen reservoir you're at? No, I, I, we weren't there. but. That's Sounds interesting like you it. mentioned Sounds that. Like yeah, it. <clears throat> it's interesting you mentioned that. We were about, I, I don't know how many clicks to the flank of the Marines who were in the reservoir, and we got word of that either through the Stars and Stripes or the you know, word of mouth. You know how stuff travels among troops, that there were a bunch of Marines trapped in the Chosen Reservoir. And we were, of course, all questioning, well, why don't they take us back shoot us up and drop us in there. And then of course we heard that it would be impossible to do that because the cloud cover was so low and it was beginning the rainy monsoon season. And in addition to the bitter cold, it would rain, that would add insult to injury. And they said, there's no way you can be dropped in there. So we just, all we could do is sympathize for the guys and, and you know, hope and pray that they could get out somehow. And uh, as you know the rest of the story, and there's a lot of them didn't make it. And it was a horrible, horrible situation for those Marines. But uh, after we got pushed all the way back, uh, they once again told us, uh, you're gonna make another combat jump. And this time it was gonna be to cut off the retreating Chinese. MacArthur was going to launch another counteroffensive. And then we loaded up, uh, we were at an air base called Tegu, mm -hmm. Tegu yeah. Airfield. And, uh, I've heard of it. Yeah. And uh, we marshaled there for several days and uh, went through the sandbox routine. You know, this is where you're going to drop in, you're going to have these mountains, this river, et cetera, et cetera. Well, Another interesting point in those combat jumps, we no more than exited the plane, and of course in jump school you're taught to count to three by thousands, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000. At that point you should feel the opening shock of your chute, you look up and check, make sure all the panels are okay, or if you had like one of these panels blown out, which is going to add your descent uh, time, you know, you're going to come down a lot faster. Mm -hmm. and. When we jumped the first time, I did the count 3,000 and my feet hit the ground. 
I later learned that they were dropping us at 600 feet. It's a lesson they learned from World War II when all the guys at 101st got shot while hanging in their parachute, 82nd also, while hanging in their parachutes coming down. So uh, the same was true when they dropped us at Munsani, and it seemed to me like it was a swamp. And across from us, we could see like a road and a whole bunch of military vehicles that uh, later we learned that the Chinese had captured that were U.S. Army vehicles, but our Air Force had shot them all down, caught them trying to sneak back north with it, and uh, they were all, they were Chinese. When Later when we moved up to where these were, there were dead Chinese hanging out of them and everything that, uh, yeah, they were going to try to move that stuff north, but... <clears throat> were you with the Army when they were overrun before the Chosen Reservoir? I'm sorry? The, the Army was overrun before the Chosen Reservoir started, right? The Ninth <laughs> Army to, or something? Yeah, like that. yeah, right, right. Were you, you weren't with them? No, no, no. Uh, you know, it was such a scattered, well, like any war, you know, you're so scattered out and et cetera, et cetera. So geographically, when the Chosen Reservoir was going on, where were you? We were we were somewhere up in that mountain pass. Yeah, we were up in that mountain pass at that and time. You were an army regiment attached to somebody, or what? Now, we us, yeah. we were uh, right. like, we we were. Sometimes we would be attached to a, a different unit, and it seemed to me like at that time. It was just a platoon of us up in that mountain pass. Like a support role or what? I mean, a support role? Yeah, right, right, right. Uh, we were just to guard that pass. That was our objective, to keep the Chinese from getting it. We did have, uh, like I said, there were times when they actually tried to come up those ravines. Sometimes it would result in a firefight. Other times they were like happy to see us and throw their hands up and surrender because, of course, I guess they'd already heard that they're going to get treated humanely and get food or whatever. I don't know, you know, but... Uh, Did you physically see the Chinese when they came? I mean, you said this, you saw millions of them, or they looked like ants. Did you see that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Where, where were you, and what alerted you that here they come, and what's going on? I mean, what were you thinking about? Uh, that's when we were... I We went slightly north, as I recall, of where that mountain pass was. And that's when they started, when the Chinese came in, and just everywhere you looked, there were Chinese troops. And, uh, of course, they didn't call it a retreat. It's just called a strategic withdrawal. <laughs> that's a clean word for hurry up and get your butt out of here or you're going to get done in. And, uh, yeah, they were just, just so many of them. Just so many of them. Did they have I, weapons? Oh, yeah. Some... There were some firefights we had with Chinese where they actually, the first wave of troops come at you would actually be throwing rocks and have sharpened bamboo and they would be throwing that, throwing the rocks. You would shoot them, the next wave would come in. Some would have them big old long Chinese rifles. Uh, they would be using them. Some would have uh, automatic weapons. And that third wave that came at you were all the seasoned uh, veteran Chinese who fought the French at, uh, uh, what was it, Dien, whatever. I know. Yeah. Uh, and they had, the, they had the fastest firing little machine gun that you ever heard in your life. It was called a burp gun. And uh, because of when it fired, that's the sound it made. You went burp, yeah. burp. And in that span of fire, it would be discharging something like eight to ten rounds. And, you know, if, it, if you got hit by it, you were hit all over. There wasn't just one hit. It was just, uh, there was a lot of it. Yeah. But, so now, what, what's your rank in your... I was a private, okay. a private first class. So you were in a platoon, you said? Yeah. Uh -huh. I mean... Is, is this your first experience in combat, what you're telling me these times? I mean, is this your young man, you're in combat? Right, I mean, is right. Is there a baptism under fire? Do you feel invincible? I mean... Uh, yeah, yeah, we did. You know, we felt like uh, we were going to 
survive all this, that there was not going to be, uh, you know, they, we were going to capture them and kill them, and we were all gung-ho, you know, get the gooks, go after the gooks, come on, we'll get them, and, and we had no idea that they had the kind of weaponry they had. Uh, a lot of that doesn't get passed down to the foot soldier of what to beware of, and there were just uh, a lot of times we would find ourselves in an ambush situation. Uh, I remember one time we were uh, I, I, once again on a guarded situation where we had the high ground, and uh, they said we're going to have to send out a patrol. And I thought to myself, a patrol, a heavy weapons company doing patrols, normally assigned to rifle companies, and they said, yeah, we need to know if there's enemy anywhere close to us. Well, they were close because we went on the patrol. We got ambushed. I mean, bad. A lot of guys got injured, and we had to drag them back and get out of there as fast as we could. And, and they're so good at, at uh, camouflaging themselves. We never knew where they were at. They were never in view. It was... Did you get to help any of the wounded yourself? or? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you have any uh, stories you remember about that? Or? Yeah, I, I have a very best friend. Uh, well, it's a lot of best friends. And uh, uh, Big Chief, Leslie Enos, uh, God rest his soul, uh, he was uh, hit by a, a mortar or artillery round in one of the firefights we had. And it took the whole inside of his right thigh out, just just like I guess like a shark would just bite it and tear the meat out, tear the flesh out. And he was in so much pain. He was a tough Indian, tough, tough. And uh, uh, before the medic could get to him, all I could do was I tried to tie something around his leg. I forget what it was. Uh, what kind of material I had or what it was that I tied around his leg. But it didn't take that long for the medic to get there. And of course, he popped him with the morphine and then chief thought he could stand up and walk, you know. And the medic told him, you gotta lay down, you gotta stay down. You're bleeding too much. You gotta keep that leg elevated because of the loss of blood. And things happen so fast in a combat situation. I don't know how he got down off the hill uh, you know, how, how they got him off of there. But uh, he, he did survive. He, never, of course, never returned to combat. Uh, it was a, what we all call the stateside. You know, he got the big one. And uh, he passed away just a few years ago down in uh, on the... Uh, he was a Pima Indian, and he died at the uh, reservation down in Arizona, oh boy. the uh, Gila River Reservation. And uh, I have another, this is really interesting. I had a really, really close friend, Wayne Charles Bebo, who was an Indian kid from uh, uh, Ball Club, Minnesota. And I'll think of what tribe he was from in a minute. But we were moving off of a hill about three o'clock one morning, and it was a nine-man squad. And Wayne was the ninth person in the squad. There were nine men squad. And we moved out and as we started going down the hillside, the sergeant said, do a head count. And the first guy said, one okay, two okay, three okay. And it went all the way back to the line and there was no response from nine. They said, eight okay, seven okay, six okay, five okay, so on down. And he said, we need a three men volunteer to go back and find Bebo. And uh, of course, I volunteered, and we went back and looked for him. We couldn't find him. What had happened was evidently they cut him off as we started moving out and captured him. About, oh, I guess three or four days later, we were moving up uh, into another combat situation, and we found him. Uh, they had tied him to a post and threw water on him and froze him to death and put cigarettes out all over his body. And, uh, of course, I was on the team that cut him down. And I always wondered uh, what happened because I did see him. They, he didn't have his dog tags. That was the big thing. And I thought, how are they ever going to identify him? And I thought about that 
laid on my mind a long time. Well, it has been not that long ago, uh, rushing back to being stateside, that my first trip back down to Fort Campbell at the Memorial Wall, his name was not on it. And I said, oh my God, what's gone, what's wrong? So I started talking to the president of our association at that time, and he said, you're gonna have to get a mountain of proof because of the Department of the Army is not gonna carve something in that granite wall without overburdening proof. So I started writing letters to everybody I could think of that might have some information about Wayne Bebo. Well, in the process, I got hooked up with another uh, Indian that knew the Bebo family from up there in Ball Club, Minnesota. And he says that, he said, Wayne is up here. He says he got buried up here in the military cemetery in Minneapolis. I've, Fort Snelling, I think, is where it is. Fort Snelling Military Cemetery. So we had a reunion up there. Uh, the 511th Regiment, which of course I belonged to that also because that was where I got my feet wet after I got out of jump school was with the 511th Regiment. And uh, one of the, uh, Frank Humphrey, who is a member of that tribe also, took me out to Fort Snelling and showed me Wayne's uh, funeral stone, uh, headstone in the cemetery there. And their appreciation for me doing this, uh, they're a part of the Chippewa, Na Ojibwe Indian. They're Ojibwe Indian, they're part of the Chippewa Nation. Their appreciation for me doing what I did to get his name, which I did, finally get his name carved on the wall down there, they presented me with an eagle feather, a fully decorated eagle feather. That usually is the highest award they can give each other, and that, I understand, is they give to a brave Hardly ever do they give that to a Caucasian or a white guy. I'm really proud of that. I have that at home hanging on the wall in a shadow box. But uh, getting back to Korea, there were a lot of times when guys would be uh, injured or needed that, you know, you needed, had to have somebody carry, you had to carry somebody hanging on your shoulder, you know. And uh, then, of course, uh, with that cold weather, once again, we had another meal because we had two, two dinners in that frozen time. We had Thanksgiving and Christmas, and both were the same. It was just unbelievably cold. And just, uh, you know, I, I just, cold weather today is one of my worst enemies, you know. Gunfire, I later came out of service and became a police officer. Gunfire didn't bother me because I knew it was friendly fire back then it was. And, uh, but over there to hear them bullets whining past your ears constantly. And on that second combat jump, it was interesting. According to my book, the 187th, uh, the Rakasans, I'll explain how we got that name. Uh, the Rakasans, we were the third battalion, which I was in, was under one of the heaviest artillery barrages by the Chinese in the Korean War. I forgot how many rounds, how, who counts them and how they count them, I don't know. We had one instance, uh, getting back to that battleship Missouri, we were trying to take a hill. We had, our infantry had charged it over and over and over. We were throwing our mortars, we had the 57 millimeter recoilless rifles, which by the way, Big Chief would just fire off his shoulder. That was, you know, they, they only recoiled about that much, very little. And he would kneel down and just hold it on his shoulder and they would fire it. We could not take that hill. So they, they finally said, well, we gonna, we're gonna have to get some fire support from heavier artillery than our own. We had our own 155s and 105s firing from behind the lines over our head, trying to hit the hills it still wasn't stopping them. The enemy could not be entrenched. They were, I mean, dug out of their trenches. So here comes a Jeep with a, a naval ensign and his radio operator. We had a lot of fun with that. You know, you join the Navy for three hots and a cot. Now you're gonna be up here in the dirt with us, with us dog faces, you know? So anyway, 
he uh, called in, got his map out and his compass and did a lot of figuring and called for uh, the first round to see if he was on the right coordinates and that. Sure enough, that first round, and when it came over our head, it sounded like a Volkswagen. Foom, foom, foom. Normally, artillery, incoming artillery, if it goes over your head, it makes a real quick sound. Foo, 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 foo. We nicknamed them foo foo birds because that foo 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 foo. And then, of course, the, sh the ground shaking. And it didn't take long the Missouri made the hill a plateau. I'm not exaggerating. They just cut it down. There was no more resistance. We were able to go ahead and move on up. So, you know, in addition to having seen it fired when I was wounded, uh, we actually got to see where the shell went. And, of course, I later learned that's a one-ton projectile. So it is huge. And uh, Well, you mentioned these two Indians that were wounded and uh, friends of yours that were wounded or killed. I mean, uh, you probably have already described the toughest part, the cold, but um, are these memories fading, John, or are they still like yesterday sometimes? Oh, sometimes. They're just, they don't go away. Uh, you know, they're they're very vivid, still still there. And uh, uh, my uh, my doctor, I have to go to for sleep and medicine. I have to believe it or not, the VA requires you to see a psychiatrist to get sleep and medicine. So anyway, when I go to Jefferson Barracks and I see her, and she constantly is asking me that, are you still having bad dreams or anything? And I tell her, no, not unless you mention it. <laughs> <laughs> so you know. Uh, it comes and goes, you know, there's times when uh, I see different mementos, uh, things that uh, picked up, you know, along the way, and uh, it reminds you, oh, and getting back to how we got the name the Rock of Sons, which, by the way, is today the 3rd Brigade of the 101st Airborne, mm -hmm. and uh, they are over in Iraq again for their fourth time. I understand that that was, and I read it once in the Rakasan book, that is something that happened at the end of World War II. The 187th Regiment were the first troops to set foot in northern Japan. The Japanese did not know that they had originally had a regiment of paratroopers that were annihilated by uh, the 11th Airborne in the Philippines. So not having a word for paratrooper, they called them rakasan, which translated is um, open umbrella falling. And that name stuck with the regiment from 1942 all the way up. Then they fought, the rakasans have fought in every military engagement the U.S. has had. So they really have a proud history, really, really proud. And at our reunions when we have them, our association pays to bring, uh, oh, I don't know how many active duty troops, but they bring a bunch of them up there, enough that they have uh, one or two sit at each table with us for the dinners. And, uh, of course, I just made a new friend. You know, I got his name and the email address, and uh, uh, he, we're staying in constant contact. And... Uh, yeah. This is good. You, good. Good what you're telling me here. Um, Korea is referred to as the Forgotten War. What are your yes. comments on that? Yes, it is. I, I'm, I'm, of course, among many who at our reunions that subject comes up frequently. Uh, it is, and uh, it, wherever you hear conversations about war, you will always hear World War II in Vietnam. I don't want to take anything away from those guys in Nam because they had one hell of a time also. They had the hot and the jungle, and their enemy was constantly uh, hidden also. They didn't know where they were. And I recently uh, had an acquaintance, a uh, Marine, who was over there that was one of those uh, rats, they call them, that went down in the hole after the Viet Cong. And uh, he said he was armed with a 12-gauge shotgun. And he said, you had to have it to shoot him out of trees, he said, because you couldn't locate him to shoot him with a rifle. But, yeah, it's, uh, it is the forgotten war, I think, because that's the way you always hear warfare described. You hear World War II and Vietnam. Rarely do they talk about Korea. And uh, 
some of the guys who have went back over to Korea that I've talked to at our reunions, they say when they go over there that the South Koreans treat them like queens or kings or something. They want their autograph and rakasan, rakasan. And uh, all the older people that know what we did for them, uh, so appreciative. But, you know, uh, in contrast, I, I, what disturbs me is I see like the Olympics when it was held in Korea, those young Koreans uh, not wanting the U.S. to be there, you know. And they're, to this day, they're arguing they don't want American troops on their soil. And I don't understand. If we pull out of there, I'm afraid they're going to be washed under once again. And it's going to be done in a hurry. Because, you know, that nitwit that's running North Korea, he has got nothing but army. The people are starving to death, and he could care less. What he's feeding, all the hum humanitarian aid that he gets, is feeding his army. And... and fueling his army, his tanks and artillery and yeah, I, I don't know if history will ever correct that and I, I seriously doubt it because this long after, after it happened, uh, we spent, we were, we landed in, in Korea in September of 1950. Uh, after the time it started and getting equipped, et cetera, uh, to get over there. And we left there, I think it was August or September of 51. Mm -hmm. So we put almost a year in there, but we were rotated, the whole regiment was rotated back to uh, a little uh, place in Japan, uh, Beppu was the name of the city. Japan, and it's on the southernmost island of Kyushu. And I later learned that is, was a resort area for the wealthy Japanese that used to come down there on vacation. We had uh, really nice quarters. I mean, it was really nice living, you know. And uh, later, after I rotated stateside, which I turned down three times, and the captain, because I had no relatives, I'm an orphan, and uh, uh, I had to get my aunt to sign me in saying she was my legal guardian. But uh, uh, I later learned that, uh, I lost my train of thought. Oh, yeah, they, when Kojido, the prisoner island, started, uh, when they found out that they were running the show from within the compound, the uh, captured prisoners, they sent the 187 uh, 3rd Battalion back over there to quell the rioting, and which they did. And I talked to some of the guys later who had been on that assignment, and they said all they did is when they get up to the fence, they just come at them with a bayonet. And, um, they, they finally learned to stay back off that fence, and uh, eventually they got that situation settled. But, so that, uh, because that was still... Uh, part of the occupation forces of Japan. That was another ribbon that I earned was occupation of Japan. But I mean, it really wasn't occupation. It was, it was really, we were treated royally by the Japanese. There was no conflict or anything, you know. And uh, being a young guy and just coming back out of combat, it was party, party, party. So, you know. How do you get through the hard times and keep your sanity? Is it your Training or faith? I mean, how do you get through the tough, difficult times? Faith. Faith and, uh, uh, it's, it's, of course, there's a lot of years behind me now. And, of course, it's, uh, it's, it's easier now to just let go. You know, it's, it's over. Uh, I'm in a warm bed at night now. And, oh, boy, that's another story. We had, on one of our moves up, I was in my sleeping bag, and we were in a little captured house, uh, abandoned, whatever. And uh, we found a bunch of, there was charcoal buried everywhere in Korea. Everywhere. I don't know. That's all they lived by, uh, was the only thing they heated their house and cooked with. So we had a roaring charcoal, really hot fire, and their kitchen thing was like, like an earthen table and 
underneath that was this opening, and that's where they put the fire in. And uh, I, I don't remember exactly how the heat got from there up to whatever they were cooking on top of that. But we all went to bed that night in our sleeping bags, and all of us tried to angle our feet as close to that heat as we could get. Uh, we woke up smelling feathers. Guess whose sleeping bag was on fire? Mm. Mine. The whole bottom was burned out of it. I had to go the rest of the time in Korea with a sleeping bag that didn't have any feet in it. Didn't have, and I couldn't get another one. I asked over and over, no, no, we don't have any extras. There's no, no more. I remember up in that mountain pass when uh, I, you know, when we would wake up at sunrise uh, after guard, you know, we all took turns doing guard duty. And uh, when I would wake up, I would just walk over with my mess kit, with, unzip the sleeping bag, and take my mess kit, my hand over to whoever had uh, any kind of food or, or coffee. Maybe we, that's what it was. I think we had our canteen cup and we'd shove it in the fire and heat the water to put that uh, really bad coffee thing that was in our sea rations. And uh, I would just walk in my sleeping bag, just stand up and walk in it, you know, little bitty steps, but still it was, that was the warmest piece of gear that I had. I, I just never had those uh, field jackets. Uh, they weren't warm. I don't, as I recall, we didn't have liners in our field jackets. Uh, I don't know when or where that came along, but for us initially, the first guys, the first wave of troops in Korea just were not equipped for cold weather. We didn't have cold weather. All we had was our leather parachute boots, actually. And those weren't very warm. Well, then they came out with what they called snow packs. And that was some kind of a rubber bottom boot that laced up. That was colder than our leather parachute boots. It was no good for that type of cold weather. I don't know if we didn't have the right kind of socks. Oh, God, man. And trying to sleep at night, just laying there shivering and shaking. It's just unbelievable. Unbelievable. And then, of course, coupled with, with the incoming fire, you know, incoming uh, rifle fire and machine gun fire. Tell me about freedom. What is, John, what does freedom mean to you as a veteran? Freedom, the opportunity to, to vote, to be able to walk down the street safely, uh, to not have to worry about enemy troops being on our soil, having seen what enemy troops do to other people. And uh, uh, I look at some of the things I see today, the way the kids dress, the way they wear their hair, and yeah, I'm, I'm not really excited about it, but you know, many times I say to myself, that's what I fought for, for them to have the right to do what they want to do. And you know, they can just go on with their life and do it. And uh, What about the price or the cost for freedom? What would you tell a young person who knows nothing about freedom or what they have today? What would you tell them about the cost of freedom? Oh man, the cost of freedom is many, many lives many, many dismembered uh, bodies. Uh, monetarily, don't even mention the money amount, uh, portion of it. It's, it's the, the mayhem, the, the seeing somebody get, uh, one of my members of my squad on one firefight we had, uh, got a bullet right straight through the center of his steel helmet, right into the forehead. Others had bullets go into the steel helmet, run around the back of their head and come out the other side, and they literally had a buzz line around their head. Uh, there's some crazy stuff. And then you see guys, you know, their intestines hanging out and blown apart, legs laying here, and the rest of the torso somewhere else. And a uh, matter of fact, I, I, I really got irate and threatened to really do bodily harm to a guy from Graves Registration. I found out that's what they're named. That's the guys that come up and pick up the dead. He picked up some of our guys and literally, like you throw a sack, threw the body up into the back of that six by. 
and a big, big guy. I went down and I told him, and I had my holster on, on Lance. I, I would have, you know, I was really hot. I said, man, those are real American paratroopers. I said, don't you have any respect for Christ's sake? I said, you're throwing them like they're a sack of flour. He said, man, he said, listen, I got to pick up so many of these guys in a day's time. He said, I can't be gentle and pick everybody up on my shoulder and lay them up on the truck and scoot them in. He said, look how many are laying here. He said, I got to pick them all up, you know. Uh, not only the American, but whatever enemy might have gotten close enough, he'd pick them up and take them too. And, uh, you know, the price of freedom, you just really can't put a price on it. It is, there is no, you know, when a lot, lot of them, I don't know how many of them today have relatives who were Korean veterans who actually seen the combat, who were actually there, who seen the blood and guts. Uh, to tell them, you know, you know, you guys owe a lot to veterans. You owe a lot to veterans. I don't mean you need to lay down a red carpet for them, but God, show them some appreciation, you know, or thank you. And I see that being done by a young generation younger than myself that, like yourself and, and others in your age group, yeah, they appreciate us, but there are just not many of you just not many of you, not enough of you. What does the American flag mean and represent to you as a veteran? Oh man, that, that, is, that is priceless. That is really a symbol of freedom. That's everything those guys got dismembered for, disemboweled, whatever. That's what Wayne Bebo suffered on that cross over there, uh, on that pole he was tied to. That's, that's what that American flag means. I mean, people that have died, that, that is why the flag has red stripes. It is the blood. It is the blood. Are you proud that you're a Korea veteran? Oh yes, very much so. I, I don't have very many clothes that don't have my Airborne Regimental patch on it. Uh, matter of fact, that jacket there has uh, a pair of my jump wings with the two combat jump stars in it. They're on every outer garment I wear. Uh, my wings are always on there because it's just, uh, Marines call themselves very elite troops, and they are, and they talk about esprit de corps, and they do have it, but we have the same thing. and really, really a tight-knit family. Paratroopers are just, I don't know, it's, I don't know if it's the training we had to go through, which is so rigorous, so hard. And matter of fact, I went, we had one guy in our unit that had been a Marine, got out of the Marine Corps, and joined the Airborne. And I asked him, I said, did you think jump training was as bad as boot camp? He said it was worse because the calisthenics were just unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah, that flag is, is, is very important. And when I see people burn that flag, then I want to really, really get ignorant. But again, I remember, well, that's what I fought for. They have the right to do that, but it isn't a right that I agree with. And it's, it's something I wish Congress would pass a law and ban it. I believe they did have a law at one time. I don't know how it got to a point where it's okay to go out and burn that flag. And there's so much blood on that flag. It, it really irritates. Oh, man. Hmm. Don't even want to go there. That's when I want to pick up arms and get back in it again. What, uh, what, what should the American people know or, or, or remember about Korea and the, the war there? Oh. What do you want the public to remember about the war? I want them to remember all those young men who gave their life so that they could live in freedom. And I have said many times, fortunately or unfortunately, American people do not know the taste of war. They haven't seen uh, mothers and babies laying 
bleeding to death or dis dismembered or again disemboweled like we have over there. And they, they don't want to see that. They don't want to see the face of war because it's not pretty. It is not a pretty thing to see. And it's, it's heart-wrenching when you're moving up through a battle area. And North Koreans, like the Chinese, are pretty ruthless. They're, I mean, they're cold-blooded killers. They don't care if it's a man, woman, or child. And, uh, uh, you know, whatever. Anything that moves, they'll kill it. And burn the houses down if they can. And, God, I would hate to see that happen in this country. And, and that's what I want them to remember. Just like Vietnam, just like World War II, those guys before us and the guys after us all went through the same thing to keep this country free, to keep these streets, the trees green and the houses erect, not on fire, burning down. Uh, that's, that's what they want. That's, that's what I would like them to remember. Well, you saw a lot of things. I mean, how did that change you as a person, your experience before and after? Oh... Because it does change you, doesn't it? Yes, it does change you. And initially, I had a lot of hostility. I was a very easily, uh, very easy to get mad and, and mad enough to fight. And uh, of course, I unfortunately, like so many of us, went to alcohol. I drank, man, did I drink in excess. And uh, it took me a while to get my head back out of the bottle. but. Uh, trying to drown those memories, and it, it don't work. They don't go away. They're as real today as they were back then. And uh, Were you ever diagnosed with post-traumatic stress or anything like that? Yes, yeah. yes. Back then or recently? Oh, back, uh, quite a while back. What did they call it back then? Was it a different name? Or no, it post-traumatic stress. Yeah. yeah. And... Uh, they had me on medication for that for quite a while, and then uh, gradually I was able to wean myself off of it. It just seems <clears> like you're doing really good. You're, yeah. I mean, you're, you're talking to me, but I don't see like you're really troubled, although you have the memories and all that. But, yeah. And uh, just a answer this question quickly, because i only got a couple minutes, and I okay. want to ask you another one. But, um, did your law enforcement career compare at all to what happened in Korea, or was it a whole different thing? It was a whole different thing. Was it a rewarding career for you? Yes, yeah. yes. How many years did you work? Uh, 28. Here? And all over North St. Louis County. Patrol? Uh, yeah, uh, uniform and detective. What, would you miss anything about that? Oh yeah, yeah, that's, that's another form of narcotic. That's, uh, it, it gets in your blood and you know, once you uh, have done it, you, you really miss it. How long have you been out? Oh, oh. 20 years? 20 years or? about 20 years, yeah. I'm working on a side project called Beyond the Badge. Uh -huh. It's a story about those who've worked in, in law enforcement mm -hmm. and, and what they're doing now, what their careers were. So remind me sometime, I need to talk to you about that. It's okay. a different story. Okay. Just put the bug in your ear there. Okay. Okay. But, um, well, we're just about out of time. This has been very enlightening for me. Um, uh -huh. Just, you know, I, my, my hope is to have the Korea documentary out in the next several months because I have mm -hmm. all the interviews. You're, you're, I've been waiting to finish it, and I'm glad I have because now you're going to be a big part of this. Good. Your story Good. will really uh, represent what you did and who you fought with and, mm -hmm. and all that, but I want you to be proud of that. And tonight we're going to show a, a small portion of the Korea film that I'm working oh, on. Oh, okay. So you'll get that tonight, too. Okay. That'll be great. Yeah. That'll be great. But, um, John, I think that's probably all. Um, let me think if there's another question. Um, I think you've covered it very well. I've heard what I, I want. I'm glad you shared. And, uh, but, um, you know, again, Korea, the forgotten war. And mm -hmm. I, I think it's important that our, our people remember about Korea, like you said, because mm -hmm. there's not a whole lot in our history books about it. Right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and again, like I said, I'm so proud of those two stars and my jump wings, but I met, times past, I met some of them old paratroopers from World War II, be they 82nd or 101st, who had as many as four or five of those little stars in their jump wings. When they were over in Europe, they would be constantly brought back and jumped again. And uh, 
I have nothing but the greatest respect for those guys. Man, and you know, like uh, in, at Best Stone when those guys were hanging off of church steeples and stuff. Oh God, yeah, that's terrible. Thank God they didn't drop us on the city of Pyongyang. Uh, not that they had any steeples. I don't recall seeing anything like that, but they dropped us out in the rice paddies beyond that, which wasn't sweet smelling, but <laughs> that's just the way it is. Do you have a lot of knowledge of the Bastogne incident? I mean, they're just in history to look back. History that I, that I read up on, you know. Uh, was it the 101st that dropped? 101st, yeah, 101st and 82nd. I think both. I think both were there. So I've done a number of interviews now with the Battle of the Bulge. Mm -hmm. and I've heard some of the stories, and I actually have one guy that was with the 506, or I think his name is, uh, oh God, Dick Burnell, I think. But anyway, he's uh -huh. a very prominent gentleman that did the whole thing. So. Right, 506 Parachute yeah, Infantry so Regiment, I'll have, I'll called some, The Rock. Yeah, I'll have some of that in the film. Yeah, the okay. At the end of my interviews, I always ask the veteran to give me a salute into the camera. From where you're seated, can you do that? Yes, sir. Okay. Proudly. Okay. Here, go ahead, right into the camera, sir. Thank you. Okay.